I have a little prayer prepared for us this morning, and I want to note that I did a little editorializing on prayer. You'll notice that something is marked in bold, and I would ask you to hold that idea, So, because we're going to come back to that idea. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Oh my, my God, God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man and died for our sins, and he will come to judge living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Catholic Church teaches, because you have revealed him, who are our eternal truth and wisdom, who can neither receive nor be deceived. In this faith, I intend to live and die. Amen. So today we will continue the study of the council as it moves along. And in the introductory uh, panel here, I have commuting, communicating the council. Some of you may have heard of Marshall McLuhan, uh, who uh, had a kind of a slogan, the medium is the message. And as modern communication technology was evolving in the 1950s and 60s, McLuhan made an argument that images are more the message than sometimes the words. So if we see things, it kind of imprints in our memory. And that's the message being sent out. So what we see. And in the beginning of the council, when it opens, and they're all, believe it or not, on YouTube and stuff, you can go there and find them if they're in black and white. But you see this grand, grand procession into St. Peter's Basilica. And at the end of the line, uh, it's too bad it's not in color because they're all dressed up in real kind of fancy clothes. Uh, the Pope is up on, on what they call the Seda Gestatoria, a, a chair that's held up by these palace attendants who are red. And he's wearing a, a very, very ornate cape that's made just to sit in that chair. He Once he gets out of the chair, he takes that off because he couldn't walk around with it. It's too heavy. And he's got the triple tiara crown on him. And next to him, there are two fan bearers carrying the big fans with peacock feathers on them, which is kind of looks almost like Persian or Egyptian. And there's this grand image of the um, the church. And when the media saw that, of course they communicated that, and it but it gave no inclinations of what was to be. It was this kind of a triumphal church, most probably somewhere around the 1700s in its mentality entering into the session as it went on. But as the council began to develop, people began to say this is more than just a photo up, but there's something really going on. And a critical moment in the council, and as we talked about last year, was this document on the renewal of the liturgy. And when it, when it came to a vote, there were 2,118 uh, 2, bishops who were eligible to vote. At, the, at this session, 1,992 voted Plotchett, or we would say yes, and I'll explain that voting a little bit because it's typical of, of the Roman, it goes back to the ancient Roman Empire. So they voted yes. 11 voted no on non Plotchett, and 180 voted Plotchett juxta modem. Okay, now we don't have that in our voting system. It says, this is saying, I support it, I'm sorry, but I have a few reservations. We don't really have that option. Like, think about how different our presidential elections would be. Vote, I, say, I vote for so-and-so, but I have some reservations. <laughs> In this system of voting, what happens then is either through documents called motu propria or actions of the Holy See, the Pope, or some, they try to address those reservations and so that they can build more unity. So when the media sees this vote taken and it's being communicated out to them by these Latin news release, they immediately say there's a great unity of thought in the council, 
And this was probably going to be a very quick thing because they, it seems like all these people from all over the world, most of whom had never met each other, and are here for a couple of, of weeks, can come together on this idea and, and, and vote. And so this is a great thing for them. Okay. When the council uh, takes its, uh, its, its voting on this thing, there's clearly a huge grassroots support because the bishops understand liturgy, they're working in their diocese, and they're, and they're experiencing problems and things like that with people's understanding and participating in the, in the liturgy and so forth. So these things are going to, this kind of shapes the initial view of the council. And it, it is also communicated by the press. The official news bulletins are issued in Latin. <clears throat> Now, a lot of people could read Latin. A lot of people could not speak Latin or understand spoken Latin because not too many people really are fluent in Latin as a, as a popular language. And there's all kinds of difficulties with it. Until really about 30 years ago, all the official documents of my religious community, legislative documents, had to be in Latin. But they were run up with certain walls, like we have a tax system within the community that's it's taxed from the local to the state tax, and then there's a federal tax that is we call provincial and general tax. But in the legislation, the legislature sets the tax rate, and they would say the tax rate is 10% of the work set, and it, should, it has to be paid in, they put it in English, US dollars based on the New York exchange rate of the dollar on such and such a day. So they didn't want any of the Friar provinces playing the, playing the commentary <laughs> market there. But all, and so you would have this Latin text, but then there would be insertions of all these little English phrases because they couldn't, there was no equivalence in Latin for these things. But these official bulletins were quickly being translated by people in the press, and many of the people who were in the secular press or people who have some kind of a seminary or church background, so they had a little bit of Latin. So they were translating these things out. So the bulletins, while official, were not really regulated when they got into the contemporary languages. So there were little spins being given to things. There was also what the media called purple news, and that was statements that John the 23rd was making about the council. John the 23rd did not attend the sessions. He he was running the church. But he was aware, and they actually had a video camera going, and he had a TV, black and white, a uh, TV in his office, and he could tune in and see what was going on, and listen to the speeches, and things like that. So, but ever so often, he would have an audience with people, he would, he would make comments about the council, and those purple news, as they called it, was setting a direction. They were, they were sending signals to the bishops as well as to the media about the Pope's intentions for the council. And they were always very, very optimistic about what he hoped the council would achieve. And a word that constantly comes up, which I'll unpackage today in class, is that this is a pastoral council. It's a if you will, using the image of the Good Shepherd, it's a council for the sheep. The shepherds have come together to nurture the sheep. Many bishops sent reports back to their diocese. And in this five volume history there, some of these historians have taken time to analyze it. In the United States, many bishops would write letters from the council that were published in their diocesan newspaper and they're talking about this liturgical change according to historians who do with the emphasis for it i did not the emphasis was being placed on use of english and the changing of the sanctuary furniture they were saying like the mass is going to be facing the people it's going to be in english and so you can understand it the theology of the document, which is shifting from a priest-centered experience to the people of God-centered experience, was not elaborated very well. That people, if you will, the theology of the change 
was not communicated. It was more, if you will, the effects of the theology that were being explained to people. That now we would use our languages and things of this sort. There was exceptions. The Italian, some Italian bishops and uh, French bishops were writing lengthy reports and commentaries. And some bishops who really didn't understand the documents and all their details would read these commentaries so they could kind of understand what was going on at the council. What I'm leading up to was the, the official language of the council becomes a crisis in the first session of the council. People don't understand. And it, ultimately, they'll have to go into simultaneous translation. That people getting up and giving speeches in Latin, which is they're not familiar with, or probably fractured Latin, that the communication of the council is kind of uh, being tripled off. And I, I know some bishops at a time, they, one a bishop told me once, I knew it went on the council because I read the International Herald every day. <laughs> they would rush to get the English newspaper and all to see what was going on. And, uh, and, and this, this uh, you know, it has a strong effect. A very noteworthy thing, and it's been, his letters have been gathered in, into a, a book list, a very small book, is the Lettere del Concilio that were written, being written by Cardinal Martini, who was the Archbishop of Milan. He would write real long theological uh, reflections on what was being done, and he would bring in different theological currents that were going on in the broader church in these letters. And for many years in the Roman universities after the council, this little booklet, because he, he moves up in his, uh, his career, uh, are, are, are companions to studying the council, these, these theological reflections. So we have this, this kind of, this is the medium that's going on. But clearly, by the end of the first session of the Vatican Council, the world media considers this a world event. It's been <coughs> regularly reported <coughs> through the news all the time about it. A another thing occurs in the first session. Before the Council begins, remember that the Curia had prepared documents for the bishops to start their discussion with. And there was a theological commission that was to kind of coordinate the whole thing and before they went out and so forth. It gets a new name in the council. It's called the doctrinal commission now. It's not called the theological commission. Right? And the head of the commission will be Cardinal Ottaviani, who was also the prefect of the Holy Office of the Inquisition which it was called at that time. And the vice chairman or vice chair will be Cardinal Michael Brown, who uh, he was a member of my religious community. And when I entered, he was the head of our order. He was Irish, but lived his whole life in Rome. He taught at our university there and was a consultant to the Inquisition and ultimately becomes a cardinal and resides in the Holy Office building and collaborates closely with Cardinal Ottaviani. During the council, if you read histories of it, Cardinal Ottaviani comes kind of like the anti-hero. He's, uh, he's somewhat of, uh, presented often as a very negative person. But I think on balance, we ought to see that he was trained in canon law. He was quite bright in it. He went to the Urbanum and received his degree in canon law. He came from a very strong Catholic family who had resisted the loss of the papal states and things of this sort. So he came from a very strong, if you will, traditional Catholic upbringing. He saw himself, and later, later on in interviews, he would see himself as a soldier of the church. That was his, and his task was to guard the doctrine of the church. That's, that was his view. He unfortunately did pick up the name Urano. Uh, he was considered the Lamb, because he did have a way of kind of charging. And, uh, but also we see from different uh, biographies that he was an extremely sensitive man, was hurt easily, and he will have a, a big moment in the council when he's hurt. 
but uh, but one thing I would say in fairness to him, because he doesn't come off well through most of the council, uh, is that he had this a very sincerity about him. After the council, he was interviewed by an Italian newspaper, and it was clear during the council he was against most of what the council was doing. He, uh, he said, I'm a soldier of the church, and I will defend what the council does, and if anyone disagrees with it, I will discipline them. And he advocated very strongly that Archbishop Lefebvre be excommunicated immediately after the council. Paul VI or had a hope through dialogue to keep him in the church, and it's not until John Paul II excommunicates him later when he starts ordaining bishops. So he, he, if you will, he was the quintessent com company man. And I'm a little bit more sympathetic in some of the stories because I know people like that. They, they do what the boss says, you know. But he, um, but he was not a theologian. He was a catalyst. He knew the numbers, and he knew procedure. And uh, and he he would use it well. Now the this mandate of the commission was to review all texts for doctrinal harmony. And Latin was the, it was the only language that could be used in these official texts. And to this day, the official texts of the council are the Latin texts. They always go back to the Latin. The Latin. They have, it's not because Jesus spoke Latin. But it's, it was the, the curial language. This changes under Paul VI by the way he makes Italian the official language of the curia. So anybody who works in the Vatican Curia has to speak Italian and many other languages. Much of the business is done in English and French and Spanish and other languages, even some of the Oriental languages. So, uh, so that was the mandate he was given. But his view was that they were to make sure that none of the texts that had been produced by the Roman Curia would be changed. Their goal was to get these documents approved. That was his view. And so, of course, that made him less amenable to theological discussion. But the, the commission is going to be expanded. And, I, and this uh, Father Trump, who was a Jesuit, was made the secretary. Now, I can be less generous about him. <laughs> he, was a, he was as mean as the Dickens, oh. and, um, and, he, and by his own right, he'd say, this can be proven. This is not gossip in the hall. <laughs> and he spoke Latin perfectly. Okay. And one of his techniques to put you down was when you attempted to speak Latin and you would be forming a phrase, in the middle of it, he would stop you and correct you. And so he had a way of intimidating people very much. His job was supposed to be, when a document was sent out to the bishops, they were to send Rhoda notes back, their comments. He not only corrected them together, but he would write a commentary. <laughs> this jackass wrote this, can you believe it? You speak of modern man, there was no such thing as a modern man. He, all this stuff about it, well, you know, obviously, people did not speak how to find him a, a, a nice person. <laughs> okay, Paul Rana, who is also a Jesuit, who is a theologian, also speaks very good Latin, and he was often becomes the nemesis of Trump. They, mm. they can argue each other out. Mm. Congar, who's on the commission, does not have great Latin, and he's always admiring Trump as much as he disagrees with him at how he can just grandstand and let off all this Latin. There are a number of elected bishops, and one of those for our American is John Cardinal Deere, the Archbishop of Detroit, is on that commission. He's uh, some of you may remember him from history. He later, after the council, becomes the head of the Conference of Bishops in the United States and really is the force of the implementation of the Council of the United States with the conference of bishop. He keeps the conference together, keeps it moving and so forth. But he's a, 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 one of these people that fill up the room when you come in. You know Cardinal Jordan's in the room when he comes in. And, and by grace of God, it, I was able to meet him on a few occasions. And he was with me the call of a red presence. And you knew the cardinal was there, you know. Where somebody like Cardinal Carberry, uh, you know, and he was very, very quiet and tended to be like more of a wallflower in a meeting where Dearden was 
here I am, Father Bard, I've come to do your will. <laughs> but this commission expands, and it's, so it's a pretty good body. And the commission represents some tensions that are actually going on between the curia and the, the pastoral bishops out in the council there. So this commission becomes very, very important in the council as it goes along. The, the next document of substance that's going to be taken up by the council, now remember their commissions have been working and then they're sending these texts around, getting comments and reworking them and reworking them and reworking them. It's called De Fontibus Revelationis, the fount of revelation, the source, Fontus is source, the source of revelation. In theology, for those of us who are older and may have studied theology before the council, theology was basically understood in, ter uh, in terms of what we used to call reiterations. The, the role of theology was to explain what the popes were saying, to reiterate what the popes were saying, to, if you will, dummy it down. And that was their job. Now, how, how would you know? Now, this, this book here, and I'm not recommending you buy this book, because it's very expensive, and, but you'll hear this term often in the history of Denzinger. Denzinger was a German who, I think in the 18th century, decided to make sort of like an encyclopedia reference book of all kinds of things that had happened in the history of the church statements of, of councils of the church, decrees of popes, uh, all this kind of stuff. It was like an inventory, and it becomes kind of the, uh, the reference book for bishops. Now, this edition here is so updated, it's got Benedict the 16th in it. I mean, that's how I, and I'm going to pass around, you can just look at it. You can see it's, uh, it's on this very kind of almost vellum paper, because there's so much in there. But if you look up, uh, like here's, Pius the sixth uh, on eras of the uh, that occur in Pistoia, which is a region in Italy, and it's just got everything in it there. And so everything in the theological commission is constantly being referred to to Denzinger. Well, that doesn't match Denzinger, and this doesn't match Denzinger. And so there it becomes like this thing. Is Denzinger the final word there? And so this text that the Curia had pr produced about Revelation, when it was received by the bishops, they, they, they found it to be very poor and in many ways unacceptable. They just thought it was just another regeneration. They, 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 they just thought it was very, very poor. 160 bishops had the mitigated gall to write comments and they were rebuffed by Trump, each one of them. <laughs> Basically told them, go sit back in the chair and listen to me. Now, another little resource book I'm going to pass around here, and this is, again, an updated one, is and it's, it's titled Consecrated Phrases, a Latin Theological Dictionary. Bishops, I'm sure today they still use it, but all these little phraseologies are in there and stuff like that. So. Uh, you, you, would, you can look in there and see as well, they'll have all these different little terms that uh, uh, are used as they go along. And so these, these were kind of the basic tools of being a bishop before the Second Vatican Council, the left and the right hand, if you will. You know, this is amazing. Everything that is in Latin immediately is translated. So if there's any doubt oh, yeah. was in English. No, it's always in Latin, and, and, and Denzinger's put out uh, in many languages, but this is the English edition. So you have the Latin on one side and the English on the other side. And then if you're not quite sure of a term, you go to the little black book and check it out. Um, so it's the bishops, that's where they were. They were they were reiterators. It's also very heavy. <laughs> God bless you. Okay. And so, so the first, first missiles for mass after the sure, uh, Vatican were all Latin and English. Right, exactly. The St. Joseph Missile right. was released. Oh. They still produce St. Joseph Missiles, and I think they still 
may have a lot in there. I'm not sure. I haven't seen one of yours. But anyway, it, when this document comes up, the bishops now are kind of like getting angry. Let's be honest. They were getting angry. And there's some nastiness going on both sides. Uh, bishops are starting to talk about the, the, the theological commission as a totalitarian state, and then of course the rhinoceros is being caricatured and in the press. You can see Cardinal Ottaviani chasing the bishops around, stuff like that. So then how do we get their voices heard? Now some of them have connections, you know, and in particular an important connection is access to the apostolic palace. They're going to be able to talk to John the 23rd. And some of them are more clever. They don't have access, but say the Pope is going to receive the bishops of Spain today on the feast of San, uh, uh, San Diego de Capistrano or something, or you know, Capistello or something like that. So the Pope receives them. And during that time, they take the opportunity to say to the Pope, this is making, you know, we have problems here, you've got to do something about it. And that's when purple. Uh, news would come out, then the Pope would say something about these things and say, you know, there's something, uh, you know, I, I, I want this to be this and I want that to be that. But the, the public blow up occurs on November 14, 1962. Remember, the image of the world is that this is a great united holy assembly. But now, this document is going to be brought to the floor. And a whole bunch of bishops line up and say they want to talk. And this is something to this day that's maddening. And it happens also, uh, we have a little bit more flexible, but not that much. But this is the, the, the Roman way. When I say Roman way, I mean the Roman imperial way. The church is run like the Roman Empire, the curia of the Roman Empire. It's run the same way. The terms are the same, but the procedures are the same. And so, for example, if Jim here has, has an objection about something in this text, or even it's hard to believe it's something I said, <laughs> <laughs> he cannot immediately raise his hand. I'd like to say something about that. He's got to go over to the secretary and sign up. And there might be a hundred people ahead of them to speak. These synods that they have a bishop to run that way. And then you say, as Jim said 10 days ago, <laughs> and this, as you can imagine, has a kind of a deadening effect on the dynamic. But this time, when this, this text has been sent to the bishops, they're getting a little smarter with procedure. Now, Atamiani knows procedure, and he'd make sure. And we know these things. These are not speculations. Congar keeps this incredible detailed journal of his experience. But there are others. Cardinal Siri, who is a great ally of Ottaviani, he keeps copious notes, a journal of the council. And he talks about meetings that are held in Ottaviani's um, office. And he lists all the people that are there, including some Dominicans. <laughs> and how they're plotting, they're going to neutralize the other group. And the other groups, are, there's the famous Belgian co college meetings, where they're sitting down thinking, how are we going to get our verse heard on this thing, too? So they're wising up, so immediately they rush and they sign up, you know, that they want to speak and so they can get there. And these are kind of the, the comments that are there. The concerns are that we believe scripture and tradition are the two sources of divine revelation, the expression of divine revelation. But in the document, they were almost separate from each other. There was scripture and there was tradition. Now, this, this might seem really, well, but remember that tradition produced the scriptures. There was a tradition, there was an oral tradition before a written tradition. And so there was, if you will, a unity or a connection to the two. The document had them completely separated. And what was really concerning was that by separating them out, that it gave the impression that things could be recognized as revelation by the magisterium that were not in the scripture or connected to the scripture in some kind of way. And there was a particular concern because of the doctrines about Mary. 
you know, the Immaculate Conception assumption, the church believed that, but we really don't have a scriptural foundation for that. So there, this was a big, big issue, and it's got a lot of subtleties to it. Very uh, strong subtleties. The other one was how inspiration in the scriptures is understood in relationship to the oral tradition of the early church. How much authority did they understand these writings until the third century do we see the church gathering a canon and saying these books are inspired and these are not. How, how was that understood? In, in the document, it seems to imply that from the very moment of the church's foundation, what we call the Bible, the New Testament, was rather clear. And we know historically that was not the case because we have all these different lists from different saints about what goes in the canon until they decide. And, and you know, you have, you have St. Athanasius who has a list and uh, Cyprian has another list. And, and when they're in this debate, you know, everybody's trying to work this out. St. Augustine gives an interesting insight. He said, we ought to start with the, the, the canons, the list from the ancient churches, so Jerusalem, Antioch, where the apostles they are. Let's start with them and see what their list is and then we'll come to a list. But ultimately, the church in its highest authority will say these books are included and these books are not included. And this is where we hear today these Gnostic Gospels and things. We say, well, why weren't they included? The criterion they used was that they were rooted in the faith of the apostles and that the church, this is what the church believes about Jesus. And the things in the Gnostic gospel is not what the church believes about Jesus. And so they were, they were put out. But in this document, this is very, very complicated and unclear. And then there's a section about errancy uh, of, of the scriptures. What we mean by that, the, the scripture is free of error. Okay. And the document basically said, the, the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, as a whole, is free from error. Now this went against a document of Pius XII in 1947, who says, in terms of the faith, there are no errors in the scripture. But some of the cultural and things that are developed can be an error, and, uh, and things don't look and the Gospels don't even jive up. And one German bishop gets up and he, t and he shows in the Gospels that they contradict each other. And, and so he says, well, how, how can they, I'm on a little facts, you know? And they say, well, here he said, you know, he had three nails and over there he says five, yes, I'm making that up. But there were examples that, you know, that if you put all four of them together, they, they don't always agree on things. And so what Pius XII had said is we distinguish the core from these literary things that help us to understand the story. And those distinctions are not there. And this about hypericity of the scriptures was not sufficiently ca cautious. And those of you who are taking the Acts of the Apostles right now, some of the things in the Acts of the Apostles <coughs> do not really connect with secular history uh, and in our next class with the uh, you know Luke mentions a particular person and kind of a little bit about him now we, we assuming that acts is taking place about 40 AD but actually historically what he mentions occurs in 69 AD see so those things we 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 and this is a hard and I can tell you teaching scripture to this recalcitrant crowd here, uh, <laughs> that we want to read the New Testament as history. And you know, it's not history, it's theology. And the historical development is the context to help us understand the faith, but the purpose is theology. So it's not really important whether this person was there in 69 or 41. The point of the story is that this is a witnessing of who Jesus is. And so, uh, so this document takes a terrible beating. And, uh, and then, so, so the, this 
they're pushing that the document be rejected. But various uh, bishops felt uh, they, they had made suggestions and they were not heard. And they, they, they were very strong on the floor about this, how, how much they felt like uh, their ideas were just constantly being uh, cut down. So a group of bishops and theologians, and this is tied up with this diligent college group, First of all, they start to have seminars in Rome, and the bishops are going to school, and they, because people in the community say, what, well, what is this thing, what is the problem with their heresy? What, what exactly does the church? They're looking in Denver, and they're not finding it. So they're having classes, theologians are teaching classes in scripture and all these things, helping them to understand what is going on. And this group of bishops with theologians draft an alternative text which is more pastoral, okay? And I'm gonna, eventually I'm gonna come and tell you what they mean by pastoral. And these lectures are being offered throughout Rome there uh, to, and, and explaining to them what the points of discussion are about. But if you recall, um, John the 23rd had said the rules of procedure were uh, two thirds to approve and simple majority to, to reject. And that would be the way that. So they opened the session to the debate. In the procedure, the bishops would talk first, but Cardinal Taviani decides he, uh, uh, no, the, the first procedure was the secretary was to read the document out literally, the whole document. This is what's on the floor. This is what's being moved. So every word is read out. And I can tell you, it's still done. And in our community, too, we, we give them written copies. They all have it. They all have it in front of them. But the secretary has to read everything into the record. It was like the first one was written in it. So he, he, the secretary, he tells the secretary, <coughs> no, don't do that. I want to speak. And he opens with a, a strong defense of the draft of what the curia has produced on their collection and intimates that if you don't go along with this, you, you may have to be investigated. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, he's running the holy office of the Inquisition, but he, but he never says it, but it's implied, okay? And then he brings up, he says the thought, the, uh, the thought that the circulation uh, of of being uh, of an alternative draft is being uh, done is absolutely against canon law, and this is the old code. He says under two 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 point three, because the code says only the pope can put things on the agenda, and this crowd of bishops who think they're going to present an alternative text to the council are breaking canon law, and he knows canon law. And he defends its lack of pastoral tone. He says, if the bishops follow this, the people will figure it out, basically. So it's, it, it doesn't serve the poor man well, because that's when he becomes the anti-hero of the council, this session in November. The, the, um, the debate continues. And Bishops are raising, is there one or two sources of revelation? Is scripture and tradition separate from each other's sources? Or are they together? And uh, so that goes on for days. Can we speak of the scripture as historical when we have different versions that contradict each other? So they're raising that again. And what is the relationship between the Old and the New Testament? Now, what, it's clear to us today, but in this text, it's not clear. So they go back. They're not put off by his talk. They get up and they start going back to the same thing again. Meanwhile, the press is, the world is watching. So many of bishops continue to uh, express concerns, but other bishops propose various compromises. Say, what about if we but to add this a little bit or that a little bit. Now remember, the, the formal position is there will be no changes. 
you vote for it as it is or else. You know? And but some are you know, and you always have that in debate. Somebody says, Well, can't we find somewhere in the middle that we all have can't we love each other once in a while? You know? And it certainly happens in religious life. We always have the peacemakers. But finally, there's a call for the vote. The vote is do we continue discussion or do we send it back to the commission that drafted it? There are, and you'll notice in the council, if you read these detailed histories, the votes are never the exact same number. Because sometimes people just say, I'm not going to it, or, uh, you know, like, whatever. They're just not there. And sometimes bishops leave and go back to their diocese for different reasons. And remember, this is a, the first council with air travel. So you can fly over the Atlantic and do some business in New York and then fly back. And, so there are going to be 2,209 uh, bishops voting. 1,368 vote for an interruption, that is to stop the debate and send it back to commission. 822 vote to continue the debate. A simple majority is 1,473. So it falls short of the simple majority. So According to the Cardinal Accountant, we push forward, we continue on. So this continues on, and of course, this public vote now is being reported. And so, what is the new news? The council is divided. Okay. There's a great division, and a new language is associated with the council. Curia bishops and their allies are now going to be labeled in the press. And if you if you like to, to do something like that, go to Time magazines. And a very, very important uh, text here in the United States is the New Yorker magazine by uh, uh, Xavier Lyon, as I know the plume, he's writing these letters from the council. And so now we have the people who are supporting the text and what is, we call them reactionaries, the Romans, the conservatives, static thinkers, or closed-minded. These are things that we're finding in the press about people like Trump and Ottaviani, Peretti, all, uh, Brown, Fernandez, all these characters that are kind of holding this position. And on the other side, the diocesan bishops and theologians that are kind of aligned with them are the progressives, the liberals, the pastoral bishops, those open to change, things of the sort. This vocabulary, yes? Can you explain what you mean by pastoral? I'm going to. Okay. We're get there. We're get there. <laughs> that, I, I was going to ask earlier. Yeah, no, we're going to get there because this is, this right, this stage in the council is not quite clear what it means, okay? <laughs> we're moving towards something that's. I, I'm, um, one of the impressions I get just by looking at the two titles, Curia Bishops and the Diocese Bishops, is that. Our diocesan bishops are really closer to the people, to common man, and the other is kind of like the corporation, the president, the CEO, aren't well, those was, the employees? Yeah, and, yeah there was a limited, and, and to this day, like if you work in the local church, you can't go out to the local church and get permission from Pope, and then the local bishop to let you in the diocese. So typically, you're perceived as being out of touch. What's yeah, really they were. They were insulated. Yeah, insulated. Yeah, 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 they were very insulated. I mean, it's a formality for no bishop would ever say right. that. When the Pope comes to visit a diocese, when he enters at the airport, he says to the Bishop Maya, I have permission to enter the diocese. And he always says, which is yes. the best. used to joke when I was in Rome, but it was like, no. Yeah. 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 Now, this was about early 60s. Yeah. 1962. November. We were just talking about the, uh, the comments about the area. Unbelievable uh, significance attached to it. And very, oh, it was very, very powerful. And in the waning years of Pius XII became more powerful really? because Pius XII was not able to do a lot of things and what his health was declining right. uh, physically and also mentally. You know, he was, he was, he was an old man, you know, and he was. I told us, you know, can't remember our name. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, and 
and again, I, and I, I'm, I know there was some nastiness on both sides, but for the most part, I, I um, follow St. Thomas, there's more grace than sin. And, um, and I think these men really had at their heart what they believed was the church and their role to defend this institution against novelty and heresies and things of this sort. But they were also very privileged too, you know, and so, and you know, it's hard to you know for the fish to know if he's in water until it gets out. Yes. <laughs> but, but the point of why I'm doing these labels here is a vocabulary sets into the life of the church associated with the Second Vatican Council that plagues us to this very day. And an interesting uh, article in American Magazine, it's a lengthy article, but it coincides with the 50th anniversary of the council, which is this year. Uh, we're celebrating that now. Uh, we're in, in the council. But American Magazine said they will never, from that issue on, use any of this terminology in any article they publish because they feel it's divisive and is not serving the church. So that if you write an article for American Magazine and you start using this kind of terminology, they will not publish your article as is. You will have to edit it because this kind of mentality. And you know, you hear, you hear this in the just like, well, I'm a conservative. And you say, really, what kind of philosophical foundations do you have for your conservatives? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, conservative is the worldview. It says that primarily we want to conserve what we know. And we, we might take an adventure, but we always want to test the new what has been conserved. That's, that's a classic conservative thing. A liberal idea is that one takes risk, pushes the envelope and so forth, with the ultimate context text that there will be a sifting out and that which is good will be preserved. But a true liberal is conservative as well. There's the equation, how it's done, and there's a whole philosophical thing. Most people go there, well, I'm conservative because I think the nun should wear a veil. Well, go be a nun and wear it then, you know, but, but I'm a boy. <laughs> so but a lot of this here, and I, would, I would just say as a, a, a comment to us as members of the church, you might want to listen to yourself sometime when we talk about the life of the church and the members of the church. But this becomes a very, very destructive thing associated with, with the council. Another significant thing happens, so now we're fighting about revelation and all these high level ideas. And a number of bishops had asked that uh, the issue of or contraception be brought to the council. Before I forget, here's another one. This is an example of I showed you a kind of magisterial theology on this subject, but this is a book by Kangar who's dealing with this whole question of scripture and tradition, just to give you an idea, because I'm passing English books out to you right there, but most of those are written in French. But so they had brought this up. Again, from people's journals, we know that a number of people went to John the 23rd privately and said, this is a delicate topic, and it's got a lot of nuances to it, and we don't think it's advisable that that be put on the council's agenda. So he takes and he appoints a special commission of brothers, of, of bishops, theologians, and lay people. This is, this is the really the first time in this Vatican II dynamic that lay people are being represented the, a, a, an American couple, the Crawleys, who had been involved with the Better World Movement, they were from Chicago, they were appointed to the vision. Both the husband and the wife they went as a conjugal group. And um, though they were housed in the religious house, and they were put in separate bedrooms. Yes. <laughs> Single beds, oh, yes. <laughs> or in Italian as we call it. Uh, camera celibati, yeah. you know, just camera matrimonio, you know, and so when you go to a hotel, they always see a celibate bed, or <laughs> it's very personal. <laughs> but anyway, this commission is uh, constituted some very significant, uh, Bernard Herring, who was a German redemptress who had a, a very pioneering in moral theology, um, had written in the 50s a three volume work. 
they always seem to go out of their periodicals, including St. John's, um, uh, called the Law of Love. And what he was doing was doing moral theology, bringing in scripture into it. And today, and you'll see it, the council is all this knowledge of ethnic theology that way. But this commission is set aside, and the Pope says all their deliberations were under the pontifical secret with the sanction of excommunication if a person revealed what was in there. Historians say the main reason that was done was because they had lay people on it, and there's a view that lay people can't keep secrets. So I'll take my word for it. <laughs> it's not a, a, a problem of the lay people alone. And um, but I'll tell you a little a cynical story. There was a, a Cardinal Peronio who was an Argentinian who was the head of the congregation of religious, and he was also a member of the Dominican laity. He took that very seriously. He had a great affection for us. And once over cocktails and dinner, he they, because they come and visit our curia, something came about subsequent to Pontifical Everything they know is everything on. He says, you know, the difference between a pontifical secret and public knowledge is one glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and Rome, Rome is a city that is like a sieve of all kinds of things like that. So what happens now we have De Fontes stuck on the floor and the birth control commission. A group of Canadian bishops go to see John Paul, or John III, and uh, in this one of these semi-private offices, they call, and the Archbishop of Cardinal, Archbishop of Montreal, Leger, is there, and at the time, he says to John XXIII, can I have a little private time with you? And so, John XXIII, Let's him in, they talk, and he says, this is what's going on on the floor. The log of Jan, the rules of procedure, we're being, the Holy Spirit is being governed by the rules of procedure. And that was a phrase he used in, later in, in, in his journal. <laughs> and he said, uh, and he said, and so he explains this to the Pope. And so the Pope at the next audience with the laity says, they, the council will just have to revise this document. It'll have to go back to commission and be revised and this and that and the other. And so all of a sudden, as the Pope has said, it's taken off the floor and sent back to commission. The document is. Um, and so, and that sets a precedent throughout the whole council. So ultimately, all these first drafts will be rejected in the first session and sent back to commission. And, uh, and they don't have to go through all these books and stuff like that, I guess. You know, I, I sense a lot of uh, letter of the law and sort of spirit of the law. Well, that was the, the world. Yeah. The, the world of religious life I entered was all about rules. That's right. That's great. And There's legalism, legalism has, has strange sides to it, you know, it's, it's minimalism. Uh, some of the young brothers in, my, in the group I entered with were given to being talkative. I was not. <laughs> one of the things that we, we rose at five in the morning and we, we went to bed at 10 30 at night you know and so there were no problems with celibacy we were totally exhausted you know? <laughs> <laughs> so collapse at night and uh but if you were mischievous not sinful because our rule doesn't bind that to sin you were um you were given the penances to do after night prayers after 10 30 so it's eating into your sleep time and the novice master used to say, uh, brother, uh, after the nightmare, and it was a balcony, because we were locked in, and the, the mission was a special part, was locked at night. So the access we had to the church was through a balcony above with a grill. So the bedrooms and you'd go into this balcony with this grill. And so he would say, brother, you know, you're talking in the corridor, you're talking in the bathroom. Uh, after night prayers, go on the balcony and say the rosary. Well, the more pious ones would go and we would say five minutes of rosary. My classmate, who did not persevere, but was a total joy to us, he would swirl up like already young, uh, and he would say, the rosary! And he would go, hey! <laughs> well, within three months, we were all saying the rosary. <laughs> That's pure legalism. I feel what I was talking about. No more, no more. And it's a mentality. It, it, it is a mentality. Yeah. But you know, you had in that um, church that a lot of us were a part of. 
I think that, you know, we have to sort through a lot of things, but we maintain the faith. Yeah. You know, you just have to recognize that's the way it is. And you work with that and you pray about it and, you know. Yeah. And, and you see this even among ourselves, people go to a wedding on Saturday afternoon. And if you're there, or people like us are there, they'll come in. Now, does this count for Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 no. yeah. Because something else is missing there, the idea of, 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 of Sunday worship, you know, is. And there. some of those humorous things helped us a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but things are going to change. Yeah. The, the first session ends, and it, it's now we know even more clearly that John the 23rd, early in his pontificate, knew that he had cancer, he was terminally ill. And uh, the, the council recesses and he dies. Uh, again, if you like to, to dig on Google's and media things, it's a world event. During the council, he publishes two encyclicals, one called Mata and Magista, Mother and Teacher, which deals with the economic question. But more important in terms of world event, he publishes an encyclical called Pachama Terrace Peace on Earth. It's the only encyclical in modern times the United Nations calls a general assembly to discuss the encyclical. And that's how his prestige was that high. And when he dies, the world uh, mourns. And his funeral uh, is, is just unbelievable. Uh, and it's the East and the West, everybody comes to his funeral. He's represented by a high official. Okay? And um, so he dies, but the, the question is, who's next? But more importantly, what's going to happen to the council? Because he's been this key guy on the rudder who every time it moves a little bit away from what he wants, he gives a talk and says, you know, but as the council is doing, and then also we'll be doing that, what are we going to get next? Okay? So he, he, the College of Cardinals at that time are 80 members. Today the standard is 120. And there's no age limit. So of the 80, some of these people are what we call venerable age, as they refer to. Uh, or Gravior, here's another name that is given to us. I, I have been referred to as Gravior in my community. I'm insulted to the hilt. But, but so, so there are this group of them that are quite elderly. And a third of them are Italians, and many associated with the Roman Curia. And the overwhelming percentage are Europeans. There's one or two people from Asia, the Philippines, the Cardinal there. And the biggest block outside of Europe is the United States. And uh, at that time, they have about six or seven Cardinals in the country, so about 10%. And we always tend to hover around 10 to 12% of the country. So they go off, uh, they, they're going to have to elect a new pope. The two people that are prominent, and again, the press, is uh, is involved with this too, and, and there's a, a wonderful edition of Life magazine who has all the contenders in there, and the two most mentioned is Cardinal Martini, who Martini, Martini, Martini is a successor. Martini is a successor. <laughs> Later, the Archbishop of Milan is Martini, you know, and um, so Martini who is a, a career diplomat in the Vatican Curia. His whole life, he starts as a young person and he's always in the Secretary of State. He, uh, he, he has a lot of relationships to Italian po politicians, and especially in the Christian Democratic Party, which was resisting the, the CPI or the Communist Party of Italy. So he has a lot of contacts in that realm there. Cardinal Siri is the Archbishop of Genoa. So they're both kind of northwestern bishops in, in the Italian geography. Montini had pretty much, during the first session of the council, aligned himself with the pastoral bishops. And he himself was quite well read in French and German theology. He was a, a, a kind of a self-taught intellectual. He was very <coughs> interested in ideas. A little anecdote about him, when he's the Archbishop of Milan, which is the financial 
capital of Italy and also the fashion capital of Italy. Um, and so you, you have to have money to, to shop there, I can assure you. But it's surrounded by massive slums and poverty. So he brings a gentleman from the United States who was very prominent in Chicago, the name is Saul Alinsky, and says to him, if you were the Archbishop of Milan, what would you do with this mess? And he says, organize the neighborhoods, the neighborhood organizers. So not himself personally, but he, through Catholic charities, he gets people to organize these neighborhoods to improve their neighborhoods, make people take pride in their neighborhoods, start to express you know, their grievances to improve things. So he has, if you will, a history there. Siri was harder than granite. Again, a canonist, and he was very close to uh, a friend of Italia. And so those two kind of emerge. The election takes place when Paul VI is elected on the sixth ballot. We know today that Paul VI got elected ultimately in the later ballots with, by Cicagnani and Ottaviani to, to support to him. So these two curia cardinals, Cicagnani had been the ambassador to the United States and then became uh, the Secretary of State. So these two curia cardinals support Paul VI as the ballots keep going along. So he's elected with the kind of Vatican II group that wants change and some curia support. So he's kind of a middle person as he comes out. And the big question is, will the, uh, the, the council continue and in what direction it will take? And he's first in cyclical he publishes, he says the council will continue, but he says, he gives a caveat. He says the council will only succeed if the church embraces the poor and lives a life of simplicity from the papacy on down and embraces a, an abundance of charity to each other in word and need. That was his view of the council. You can imagine all oh, oh, the bees that are buzzing, yes. All right, I'm sorry for all of us who could understand this. Do uh, my eyes are deceiving me or I don't know what? But, so Paul the Sixth, well, which one is it? Is Montini? Mont Montini. Yeah. Montini, thank you. Yeah, from, from Milan, okay, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's from the, the, Thank you. Yeah, so he's from Milan. He's originally from the north of Italy uh, by origin. So he, he proclaims the council will continue. That was immediately everybody wanted to know. He also will continue the birth control commission. And, and, and all, so everything is going to be as usual. And at this time, all these drafts are back in commission. So from the first session to the second session, it's not like everybody's sitting on their hands. There are meetings being held in different parts of Europe mainly, and most of it's in Europe, and places like Switzerland and Belgium and France, and so there's different committees of meeting and working on these things, and there's theologians and bishops and things of this all collaborating. So did Ottaviani anticipate he would do this? When he threw his support to him, was that the answer? Unfortunately, Ottaviani if he had a journal, he never revealed it. We know more about Ottaviani's intentions from Siri than we do from Ottaviani. Uh, okay. okay. But uh, a little footnote on Siri. When uh, <coughs> Pius XII died, Siri was the contender against Roncalli, who becomes John the Twenty Third. Siri's the contender against Montini, who becomes Paul VI. Siri is the contender against John Paul I. Siri is the contender against John Paul II. <laughs> Not, then, he's, then, he's, then he dies. <laughs> but he, was, he always had the respect of a group of his cardinal peers. He was not, not I mean, he was a formidable person and a very, very handsome man. I guess Montini is now deceased. Yes, we've had three popes since. 
Okay, the John Paul one, John Paul two, and yes, it's and Francis. So he dies in 58, 1958. What was the encyclical that you mentioned that uh, from uh, John 23rd? It's a Plasia some or something. I don't know the exact spelling of it, but it's the first encyclical he issues, and in there he says that this sense of poverty and charity is what's going to make the council go. It's interesting that we're now in a pontificate of Francis, and we seem like, and he's the first pope to, to become a priest after the council. All of these people were pretty bad. Uh, not no pope until Pope Francis was in the seminary after. They were all through that. Okay. Now I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to do some historical violence here. Uh, remember, we were in 1962, early 1963. I want to jump ahead to 1965. And I'm going to go back to, to that document, De Fundus, remember the form, the source. What happens with this big debate? What happens there? Ultimately, a document is going to be approved at a very, very high level. Only 11 people will vote against it in the end. Um, but the document has been re redone, and, it's, and it has six chapters. And what I'd like to do, and I've given you the whole document. You can get all these documents off the Vatican website. Free. But the first thing we want to, to say, what is pastoral? Pastoral in the sense of Vatican II means that fundamental truths are articulated with accuracy and authenticity in a way that's intelligible <clears throat> to the people of God. So we're, we're not changing, and Vatican II taught no new doctrine. It taught, it taught what the church believed, but it taught it in a way that you and I could understand. That's the pastoral mission of Vatican II, to be intelligible to the people of God, to, to, that we could understand it. So the first thing, if we look in the document, chapter one, there's the preface which says, hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith, the sacred synod sin takes its directions from St. John. We announce to you the eternal life which dwelled with the Father and was made visible to us. So that's the purpose. Why they're, why, that's why they're producing a document on Revelation, so that they can announce to us. In and again, in papal documents, you know, they have these numbers. In chapter one, number two, they tell us what revelation is. And this is, you, I'm sure you've heard, revelation understood before the council was the doctrine of the church. And we received it through the catechism. Is that what revelation is? In what we call fundamental theology. No. Fundamentally, revelation is in within the mystery of God. Hear that word mystery. It's not a cognitive thing. It's a mystery. In the mystery of God, God chose to speak to us. That's what revelation is. We did not initiate it. God chose to speak to you and has been in conversation, communication with us from the moment of creation. And God created us and chose to be in a relationship to us. The word her son means true sound. So God is a her son and he makes us her sons. So through the sound, through the word, revelation. I'm going to be quite candid with you. But professors I had in theology, this was an enlightened thing that, that they were so taught to get the words right of the doctrine, they did not see the mystical side of revelation that all of us can open ourselves to. You do not have to have a doctorate in theology to experience revelation. God is speaking to us. 
in the church. Do you see what pastoral theology looks like? It's, it's different. And the, all the documents of Vatican II, if you read them, always are trying to help us to understand the mystery, the fundamental theology, in a practical way for our lived experience. And how many times um, we find ourselves asking for revelation. Yesterday, uh, Bon Jovi has a new song out called This Is Our House. And I have an idea how to do something with that with the students. And so I downloaded it from the iTunes on my phone. Do you know the song? It's got okay, We're just very excited that you are. Yeah. <laughs> we're amazed you're the current. <laughs> oh, well, you have to. If you don't, if you don't uh, swim with the current, you're down. That's cool. And so I'm listening to this. I downloaded it and I'm listening to the words. And you can download it. Well, the rest show me where you can get the words on the internet. So I look at the words and I'm trying to get it down. You know? And so I'm listening and I leave here and I'm just a t shirt and a few new shots. I'm going home. I can have it up. And I walk out of the chapel. I know where the steps is, exit steps. So there, yeah. there's a young man sitting there. And he just his face looked anguished. And I said to him, Are you okay? You know, this is exam time. And he, he just burst out crying. And so I sat next to him. And he had just found out within the last 10 minutes that his grandmother was very close to his God. And, and his mother called him. He called the grandmother to say goodbye to him. And and so he said, then he decided to go to church and pray for her, but they had a Eucharistic adoration and he started to fall, so he left. And so I don't know this kid. I've never seen him. I'm sitting there. He doesn't know who the heck I am. He doesn't see my name on the mark. And I'm sitting there, and the kid's crying. You know, if you've been trained in pastoral ministry, you know that people are crying. You don't say anything, you just let them cry. So I'm sitting there crying. But I'm praying and I said, Oh God, tell me the words to say. If you will, give me a private revelation, a pastoral revelation, just what to say to this young man. And I was thinking I could have been getting motivated and I could have said this and I could have said that, you know, it would have been better. But we, we, we talked a little while and prayed and I gave him a big hug and I said to him, he said, It's so hard to keep you all alone in my when my family was home for this time, so it was. And I said, you're not alone. We're here at Newman for you. And so I said, here's my cell phone number. And I gave it to him, and I put my name there. And I said, oh, how do you need me? Well, I get home, and I'm empty the dishwasher, and the phone rings. Well, I recognize it. And uh, I pick up the phone, and it's a woman. It's, it's the hello. She says, is this brother Edward? I said, yes, it is. She says, I'm this boy's mother. I'm from Chicago. She said, I'm calling to thank you so much that you were there for him. She said, we've been so worried about him. And she said, I prayed to God to send some help for him. So I'll be, I'll be extrapolating and making this a big story. If you read this document, this document is long, this is how God works in history. This is revelation, divine revelation, operative in the life of the church. And it says, and, and so the document tells us that God began to speak to us in the beginning through creation and then through the patriarchs and the prophets. But when we moved to, to, um, to number four there, you said, then after speaking in many ways and various ways through the prophets, now at last, these days, God has spoken to us in his son. Okay. Jesus, if you, if you go down, there's a little short paragraph that says, Crispin, the Christian dispensation, because of this revelation of Jesus, the Christ, is definitive. There is no new revelation after Jesus. What the churches and the tradition is going to constantly be receiving revelations or insights to understand this phenomenal reality of the incarnation for the salvation of everyone in all time in all places so the christian dispensation therefore is a new and a definitive covenant definitive <clears throat> so we're not going to later on learn that there's four persons to the Trinity, or 
something else. But it's the, <coughs> Jesus is the definitive revelation of God to us, the incarnate word. God spoke the word in Genesis and said, let there be this, and it's good. Now we have the word speaking to us in Christ Jesus in, in a complete way. So when we look at the stars and the moon, and we can say, what a great power to create this beauty, this reality. But in Jesus Christ, we see the fullness of God, which is love. And we learn from Jesus Christ that God is Trinity, and these three divine persons live a life of eternal, perfect, and indefectible love. And then we are called to enter into that church. It's through Jesus we learn these things. And the church ponders in the tradition to understand this and articulate this with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we see 600 years the church shows, what did, who is this Jesus? Where is this Holy Spirit with him? And so that in the tradition, now tradition is different than church history. Tradition is the activity of God revealing in the life of the church. That's the tradition of the church. So when we talk about crusades and all this kind of stuff, that's in the history of the church. But tradition is that element of ongoing revelation to us in the church. In number uh, paragraph six, if you want, I'm just highlighting this because I want to teach you to read this. Okay. Now this revelation, it says, totally transcends the understanding of the human mind. The intellect is an aid to embrace revelation, but it can never be confused with it. It's always mystery. It always leaves us in a state of awe and spiritual hunger, a longing, a longing. So it's very, very different than that. Then the, the document will go on if you look at paragraph uh, seven, they, they talk about well, how does the scripture come about? The apostles are orally proclaiming the revelation they have received in Christ through their lips that they heard from Christ. But the Holy Spirit inspires certain people to write down this message, this inspired message. And so the apostolic preaching and the inspired books have an integral real relationship. And this tradition, if you see in paragraph, that this tradition, which comes from the apostle, developed in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit. So we have this, this incarnational event, and then as a church, we go on through. Another question that comes up is the connection between the two. And so paragraph five, hence, there exists a close connection and communication between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. They're not two thoughts. There's this interplay. And what exactly is it? It's a mystery. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas says a prudent person, when dealing with a mystery, never tries to define it in great detail. Because when you, if you try to do that, then you're no longer recognizing it as a mystery, but a, a, an intellectual concept. And one of the criticisms made by a very eminent Thomas of the Curia document was they were being imprudent, according to St. Thomas, because they were trying to define the relationship for people. And they, they were they were kind of forgotten the mystery. And then lastly, I want to point out just two more little paragraphs and then I'm going to spare you and I want to hear some thoughts from you. Sacred, paragraph 10, sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. Holding fast to this deposit, the entire holy people united with their shepherds remain always steadfast in the teaching of the apostle and the common life, the breaking of the bread and prayers the first reference to Acts, and you notice they say the Greek text. 
in the council, the definitive Bible was the Greek Bible. They didn't use a Latin or a modern translation. They didn't have the Bible. So, holding to practicing and professing the heritage of the, of the faith, it becomes on the part of the bishops and the faithful a, a single common effort. So, how is Revelation the bishops with the church, with the faithful? We are going to journey in the mystery of Revelation. It's not just the magisterium, which the early documents were. The magisterium will tell us what revelation is. say, wait a minute, wait, what happens to the, the people of God in this thing? Don't they experience revelation? Aren't they having, isn't little brother ever sitting on the step with a, a kid crying? If, if he prays for God to give him the word, does he have to call wrong? <laughs> I'm being facetious. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, and in the ending paragraph of Number two, it is clear, therefore, that the sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the church, in accord with God's most wise design, are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the other, that all together, each in its own way, under the action of the Holy Spirit, contribute effectively for the salvation of souls. What is the shepherd about? What is the pastor? That's pastor comes from shepherd. What is the pastor trying to do? He's going out to get the one more sheep. He's bringing them into the fold. So that's when we speak of the council being a pastoral council. That's the thread that's running through all of these documents that we will look at. Yes. And the other side of that shepherd going out to get the one last sheep is not abandoning that sheep. I mean, that's the other side of it. God desires all so never forget that. And anytime we start to say, you know, write those people off and this, that, and the other. As I mentioned to somebody, uh, the pastor recently, when he said something, or entertainment at the table, I didn't say anything. He said, well, aren't you going to say something? I said, I've never learned how to speak to a prejudice, a, a bigoted, ignorant, small mind. <laughs> <laughs> And so he loves it. He loves it. He's been quoting that ever since. He says, I don't know how to In my house, there are many mansions. And if I had, had not told you so, uh, oh, if it were not true, I would not have told you so. Okay. I, and the, how does that jive with Father Thomas's sermon on the narrow gap to salvation? Uh, is there a connection or not? Well, remember, J Jesus is preaching is a, a kind of an artist. You know, it, again, we're Western people who have come out of logic. So we're always trying to impose a logic on the New Testament. Jesus doesn't teach that. He's an occasional preacher. He comes in here and he says, It is good for you to rest, Helen. God knows your labors have been many. And you, I've noticed you have not labored at all. <laughs> That's why we always read the text. He was a Jesuit trained. We read the text. And so there is a finality. Jesus is reminding us everything doesn't go. Okay, but he's also telling us in my house there are many mansions. What we are, it's an interpretation, it's not definitive doctrine. That those who say, like, just hypothetically, somebody who has a terrible life, but at the last moments of their life they repent, they will be saved. But will, will they participate in having the same life that somebody from birth was faithful all their life? Well, there's a view that there's levels of participation in heaven. Well, you get a different seat. <laughs> yeah, you get a different seat. Okay. So all of these kind of ideas and that kind of things. Did, did someone over here have their hand up? Okay. Well then, okay. But there's also a view, he says, that uh, the master of the vineyard is going to pay the folks that started at the wee hours of the morning the same a wage, so he, he pays the guys who get in and start working, you know, one hour to quit. Yeah. 
So I mean, there's just, I mean, I'm just throwing no, that out the there. Wages the wages to enter the kingdom, though. Yeah. Well, what was that? The wages to enter the kingdom. So even those who came at the end. But if we're all getting the same thing. thing, I can afford the same answer. Yeah, I'm composed, just joking about no, it. Oh, you're talking about composing a quantitative idea. Oh, yes, it's I know. symbolic. Uh, parables are symbolic. They're not, they're not historical. I guess so, what I'm just saying is, in, in that story, they all enter the kingdom. Yes. Yeah. And, and there was no socioeconomic well, that's another reason. Well, okay, okay. Uh, so that's a, a very complicated text. Any other? Uh, yes. Well, I just bring up the question of uh, Protestants. Such a division in our church. Uh, what do you think is going on now? I don't think, but I pray for them because they're my brothers and sisters. <laughs> because we have enough scraps of our own. But yeah. the thing about that today, like how, how, you know, the church lives in the world and how the media help shape our understanding of the council. And sometimes I'm sure in your own mind, you think, and you hear this about people like you get a new person at a distance, a liberal or a conservative. <laughs> Have you ever had that bad thought? Or yeah. the confession? <laughs> <laughs> Brother, early on, you, you talked about the, the canonists and the theologians. And is there a, a tension within the church between? Uh, legalists and the uh, ones who are trying to understand the mystery and how how is that mitigated? See, that's 